Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Brother Clinton, and you are back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, as Jesus Christ commanded. You know, I just uploaded a video a few minutes ago called, How Can We Grow in Christ Without Going to Church? Question mark. And part of the focal point of the message in that video was taken from 1 Peter chapter 2, wherein it is written, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Praise the Lord. And if you haven't seen that message, I would encourage you to go and, and take a look at it. it. It shall be a great blessing to you if you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe his word. The point is that I'm making from this is that if we grow in Christ by abiding in his word, then we are going to understand the truth and the truth will make us free. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you're tired of hearing me say that, then you don't belong here. You don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't hear his word. But if you rejoice in hearing me say that, praise God, because I've said it many times, and I'm going to continue to say it many times, because it's the word of God. And the scripture says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And it is only those who speak as the oracles of God and abide in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ who are going to enter into the kingdom of God. Because the Bible says, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. And again, it is written, uh, 1 Timothy 4.16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And the Bible says so many times, even just in the New Testament, that if we are to abide in the doctrine of Christ, that we are not to change the words of God and trade them for the traditions of men, that we are not to add to the word of God or take away from it, because those that add to the scripture, to them shall be added the plagues that are written in this book. And to those that take away from the scripture, their name shall be taken out of the book of life. And so we need to abide in the word of God in order to please God and in order to enter into the kingdom of God. And in Revelation 22, 14, it is written, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and that they may enter in through the gates into the city. So why am I saying all that? To say this, when I first came to the Lord Jesus Christ, I, I was first born again in 1994. And I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I was born again, and I was really on fire for God, if I may use that term. And I was reading the scripture every day, and not because somebody kept telling me to read the scripture, but because I wanted to. It was, it was that, that pure milk of the word that I desired that, so that I might grow thereby. And as I did that, you know, I went to this church and that church, and I read this book and that book, because I didn't have anybody telling me on YouTube like I tell you all the time, when people give you these books and send you these videos, just tell them no thank you and stay in the Word of God. I didn't have anybody to disciple me like that. I just, all I had was a Bible and the Spirit of God. And so, um, yeah, I went to this church and that church. I listened to this radio sermon and that radio sermon. I listened to guys like um, Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah. I, I read books by, you know, Max Lucado. And I had certainly heard of Charles Spurgeon and, you know, guys like... Uh, Sproul, what's his name, R.C. Sproul, and uh, many other such like theologians. And I used to listen to and read things by these men, and although they said some things that were written in the Word of God, they said a lot of things that are not written in the Word of God, and I got very confused. And I got into the Calvinist doctrine uh, in about the first couple of years that I was born again. I wasn't even saved yet, didn't even know about the gospel of Christ. I know that some of you are confused about that, and if you have questions about that, please ask me, and I'll be happy to refer you to teachings on this channel that will show you the difference between being born again and being saved as a Christian, being saved from your sins. But praise the Lord, I, I didn't even know about how to obey the gospel in those days and be saved from my sins, but I was born again, and I loved the Word of God, and I just, every time somebody handed me a book about the Bible, I just said, sure, I'll take that, and I just read it, and... and um, and meditated on those things and got filled with those things. And after a couple of years of that, the Lord stopped me right in my tracks. And he said, my son, I'm not saying he's told me this in an audible voice, but he just let me know. He said, my son, you need to stop all that stuff. You need to put down that theology and come away from it, step away from it. And you need to put away all those books and stop listening to all those radio sermons and stop going to all those chapel and church services. And you need to just read my word, fast and pray, and let me show you the truth of who I am. And 
I knew that that was what he wanted me to do. Like I said, it wasn't in an audible voice in that particular time that he told me that. It was just something that I knew was from him. And so I said, yes, Lord, as we do when, when God commands us anything, we say, yes, Lord, and we do it. And so um, he began to wash me from all the traditions that I had been taught. Uh, I, like I said, I got caught up with the Calvinists, and I started to believe that once saved, always saved nonsense. And, and uh, you know, I was taught that baptism had nothing to do with our salvation, that it was just an outward show, work of grace or an outward showing of an inward change or an act of obedience after salvation, all that nonsense that they say in the churches that isn't in the Bible anywhere. And um, that's, that's what I believed, and that's what I actually taught people. I was teaching people that. And the scripture says, Be not many masters, for theirs is the greater condemnation. And I thank God, thank you, Father, hallelujah, that he pulled me out of that and caused me to come to him where I could see the light. And he caused me to, to understand, first and foremost, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, which is God's way of saying, if it's not written in my word, then it shouldn't be coming out of your mouth. Period. End of story. And if anybody will, will, will abide by that rule, then they will be walking in the light. Because the Bible says if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. When I say this word and I hold up this book, this is my King James Bible. For those of you who speak English, this is the word of God. Okay, Other Bibles that are worded differently in the English language are not the word of God. And they can't be the word of God according to the word of God. If you have questions about that, Feel free to ask me, and I'll be happy to send you some video teachings that will explain that for you. I'm not going to go into that in detail right here. I'm just going to stand on that fact. Praise the Lord. And by the way, if you want to argue about that, please don't take that to me. Take it somewhere else. If you just want to argue, go somewhere else. But if you have earnest questions and you'd like to understand why I said what I just said, I'll be happy to explain it to you. Praise the Lord. Having said that, I want to talk to you about a theologian whose name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I'm not here to talk about him as a man. I never knew him. Um, he died a long time ago. I have him on. Uh, I have an article on Wikipedia in front of me. So he died in 1892, at the age of 57. Charles Haddon Spurgeon is a very popular theologian that a lot of people listen to, and he his books and his videos are some of those things that people will immediately start handing to you once you step out of the darkness and into the religious arena. When I say step out of the darkness into the religious arena. What I mean is that when you are when you are not in Jesus Christ, you are a child of the devil. Okay, you are a child of wrath. Doesn't matter whether you believe that to be true or not, it is so. Okay? And Jesus Christ said to the Pharisees that they were of their father the devil. And if you're not if your father isn't God, if you're not adopted into the family of God by Jesus Christ, by being baptized in his name and filled with his spirit and abiding in his word, then you're not of the family of God. You're a child of the devil. Okay, that's not my opinion. That's just a fact. Okay, so and and that when I say that's just a fact, that, that's what I mean is it's according to God's word. That's what God considers the case to be. If you're not of Him, then you're of the devil. If your father isn't God, then your father is the devil. It's really just that simple. It doesn't matter if you think you're a Christian because you're a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Pentecostal or an Apostolic or a Catholic or whatever. God doesn't. God does not recognize any of those denominations as being part of His family. He doesn't recognize anybody that's a part of those denominations as being a part of his family. Because God has said, Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, and I will be a father unto you. Okay, This is what the Lord has said. If you come out from among them, then I will be a father unto you. If you remain among them, then you're of them and you're not of me. This is what the Lord says. So, having said that, Charles Spurgeon in his writings and his, his videos nowadays, because everybody's used to YouTube, um, is something that as soon as you step out of the darkness into the religious arena, as soon as you start making it known that you're coming away from the darkness and headed towards the light, then your adversary, the devil, will send you agents who will feed you with theology. Okay, When, when the devil sees that you are trying to turn away from the darkness and trying to turn to the light, he will come at you with every false lying form of light that he can think of. Okay, And the Bible says that the devil comes as an angel of light. And so it's no marvel if his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness. And so it is that when you go into any, any, any Protestant denomination, uh, any church, you know, any building that is called a church, a Protestant denomination, you will see behind the pulpit a man who has graduated from a seminary. 
Okay, he's been sent there by the devil. Okay, God doesn't have seminaries. God doesn't send his his people to seminary to learn how to be a pastor. The devil does. The devil's ministers go to seminary and they learn all the nonsense and garbage of theology so that they can be thoroughly deceived and convinced of their deception so that they will go out and start businesses called churches and spread their deception to other people. That's what seminaries are for. That's not just an unfortunate byproduct of a seminary. That's the purpose of a seminary. Seminaries are Jesuit institutions. For those of you who don't know, the Jesuits are a militant Roman Catholic organization that was created under Ignatius Loyola in the 16th century for the purpose of quenching or quenching the Protestant Reformation. People were coming out of the Catholic Church and discovering from the scripture that the Catholic Church was lying to them. So the Catholic Church organized a, a or, or built an organization called the Jesuits, which they call the Society of Jesus, um, which is blasphemy because they have nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that organization was, was designed kind of like the CIA of Rome. It's, in fact, it's not kind of like, it's exactly what it is. It's the intelligence arm of Rome. And this, just like the CIA, the people in the CIA are there to lie, steal, kill, um, whatever it takes to accomplish their purpose in order to subvert governments and bring people under the, under the, under the hegemony and headship of the government that they work for. Well, that's what the Jesuits are for, for Rome. Okay, they were created to destroy the Protestant Reformation with lies, with murder, with, with you know, um, speaking evil about people, with false rumors, with setting up pastors with prostitutes. Um, whether that's true or not doesn't matter. Uh, they, they, you know, to break up marriages, to break up churches, and also to send false agents into the churches to pretend to be Christians, but to teach people false doctrines so that they would not be in the doctrine of Christ, but still think that they were Christians. That's the work of the Jesuits. Pardon me, just let me breathe. That was a long sentence. That was one of like Paul's sentences. That, pardon me, that was like one of Paul's sentences. But, um, ooh, <laughs> praise the Lord. Anyway, um, that's what the Jesuits are for. And so the Jesuits created seminaries for the purpose of teaching wrong doctrines to people in various denominations because all denominations belong to that same whore beast system. doesn't matter what the denomination is. They're all harlot daughters of that Roman whore, which is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so a seminary is for that specific purpose, to teach people garbage and lies through the witchcraft of theology, which is the perversion of the truth. Theology is, is the perversion of the truth. It's witchcraft. And it is designed for the per it was designed and is implemented for the purpose of resting the scripture w r e s t i n g resting twisting perverting the scripture in order to accommodate doctrines that are not written in the scripture by the purposeful misuse of words and phrases in foreign languages that you don't understand um, and false claims of you know better and older and reliable manuscripts and things like that or I should say false claims of older and more reliable manuscripts I'm sure you've all heard that before. Um, so that's what theology is. It's the art of resting or perverting the scripture to accommodate doctrines that are not in the scripture by the purposeful misuse of words and phrases in foreign languages that you don't understand. Um, so theologians are people that are raised up by the devil. They're the devil's ministers and they appear as ministers of righteousness. And they stand in the pulpit with their degrees of divinity and they say, I know Greek and Hebrew, and I've read the Bible 10 times or 20 times or 50 times or whatever. I've been reading the Bible since before you were in diapers, so I know everything, and let me just teach you. And so the people in the churches just go, and they bring their Bibles, but they won't read them. And they sit before these men, and they listen to the garbage and nonsense that they learned in, in seminary. And so these people then become filled with that same garbage and nonsense. And it's different versions of garbage and nonsense in each denomination. So this guy's garbage and nonsense is called Baptist. And this guy's garbage and nonsense is called Lutheran. And this guy's garbage and nonsense is called Apostolic. And this guy's garbage and nonsense is called Episcopalian. And this guy's garbage and nonsense is called Presbyterian. Okay, I could go on and on and on for like hours. Literally, there are hundreds of different denominations, groups of people that have rejected the name of Jesus Christ and called themselves by a lesser name. And they all have one thing in common, garbage and nonsense. It's just that they all call their garbage and nonsense by different names. 
And so when you come out of the when you begin to come out of the darkness and seek the light, the devil is going to send his agents to you. You can count on this. It's going to happen. And if you if you have begun to seek the Lord Jesus Christ, then this is already happening and you're and you understand exactly what I'm telling you. And they will come out from all they will come out from the woodwork and 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 they will they'll come out from every place and they'll say you got to read this book you got to hear this video you got to come to my church and hear my pastor okay just respectfully tell these people no thank you no thank you i'm just going to stay in the bible for right now okay i'm just going to stay in the bible for right now am i saying that is you know am i brother clinton saying that you know you're i'm the pastor and you're never allowed to read any other book but the bible no, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that at least for your first year that you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, the only book that you should be reading is the Bible. And in your first year, you should, be, you should have read through the Bible at least twice. In your first year, at least twice. Okay, And at that point, when you've read through the Bible at least twice, then if God leads you to read some book or whatever, then if God leads you to do so, then that's fine. You do that, okay? However, it is only at that point that you will be able to begin to discern. And remember that I use the word begin right here. It's, the, it's only at that point that you will be able to begin to discern whether or not that book that somebody handed you is the truth, is the truth or a lie. Okay? And, you, and it may be a lie, and you, may not, you might not even realize it if you've only been in the Bible for a year, if you've only been serving God for a year. However, if, you, if you're really serving God and his word is in you and you're abiding in his word, then whatever book anybody hands you, if it's, if it's full of lies, then you're going to see it. Okay? However, if you've not been abiding in the word of God, then if, it's full of lies, if this book is full of lies that somebody hands you, you're not going to see that and you're going to continue to believe lies. And you're going to be, continued, you're going to be continually led away from the truth of the scripture. Okay. Now, in the case of this particular man, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he, he's a very respected theologian, and I'm not going to speak against him as a man. I wouldn't do so. I'm not here to slander anybody. Plus that, the man's passed away, so he can't, he's not here to defend himself. Okay. But Charles Haddon Spurgeon was not a Christian. He was a Baptist. He was a Baptist. Okay. Baptists are not Christians. If you don't understand why I say that, please ask me and give me the opportunity to explain, because I am a Christian and I speak as the oracles of God. And the reason I say that Baptists are not Christians isn't because I hate them or have something against them personally. It's because they're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Baptist people reject the doctrine of Christ. They believe in a false God that doesn't exist, and they believe in a false gospel that can't save anyone. The Baptist religion is particularly infiltrated by the Calvinist doctrine, and so was Charles Spurgeon. Okay. I, I have a, an, an article pulled up on Wikipedia right here, and I know that Wikipedia is not you know, the end-all authority on everything, but this is a pretty good idea. Uh, you know, these are s simple things about Charles Spurgeon that I don't think are being lied about, and these are just some simple facts about him that I want to share with you. I'm just going to read two paragraphs of this. Um, it says, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, from 19 June 1834 until 31 January 1892, uh, was an English particular Baptist preacher. 1892, was that when he died? Yes, and he was age 57. It says, he was an English particular Baptist preacher. The words particular Baptist preacher are a link on this particular article, so I decided to follow that, and it brought me to another Wikipedia article, which is called Strict Baptists. I just want to share this with you real quick. Groups calling themselves Strict Baptists are often differentiated from those calling themselves Reformed Baptists, sharing the same Calvinist doctrine but differing on ecclesiastical polity. Strict Baptists generally refer to generally prefer a Congregationalist polity. Now, I won't go into that right now, that's a whole different matter, but Congregationalist is, is different than Presbyterian. Um, the group of strict Baptists called strict and particular Baptists, this is why we came to this link, because the other one spoke about particular Baptists. The group of strict Baptists called strict and particular Baptists are Baptists who believe in a Calvinist or Reformed interpretation of Christian salvation. Okay, so that's what it means by a particular Baptist. Now let's go back, going back to the first uh, article, and I'm going to leave links uh, under, in the information box if any of you are interested in reading these, but it, it's right here on Wikipedia. You can just look it up under Charles Spurgeon. Um, it says, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was an English particular Baptist preacher. Okay, So we know by this, if we know the word of God, that he wasn't a Christian because he believed Calvinist doctrines. And I haven't gotten into detail on that here, but I will in a moment. 
It says Spurgeon remains highly influential among Christians at, of various denominations. Okay, now Christians of various denominations is a very curious statement because there are no Christians in denominations. There, there are no denominations in the Church of Jesus Christ. Those who belong to a denomination belong to a denomination. Those who belong to Jesus Christ belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, they're, they're, those two don't mix. It's like oil and water. You either belong to a denomination or you belong to Jesus Christ. You cannot belong to both because no denomination belongs to Jesus Christ. Period. End of story. So, And when I say that, I don't say that to be prideful. I just say that because there's no such thing in the Bible as denominations. Okay, The Bible speaks about wickedness like that, but it doesn't say that anything like that exists in the church of Jesus Christ. So, um, he remains highly influential among Christians of various denominations. Pardon me, I don't want to sneeze while making a video. Among whom he is known as the Prince of Preachers. He was a strong figure in the Reformed Baptist tradition, defending the church in agreement with the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. That's another link, and, and I'm not going to go over all that because it's a long and wordy uh, thing, but I do want to go over a part of it with you in just a moment. Okay. Um, Defending the Church in Agreement with the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, Understanding and Opposing the Liberal and Pragmatic Theological Tendencies of the Church of His Day. Spurgeon was pastor of the Congregation of the New Park Street Chapel, later the Metropolitan Tabernacle, in London for 38 years. He was part of several controversies with the Baptist Union of Great Britain, and later he left the denomination over doctrinal convictions. In 1867, he started a charity organization which is now called Spurgeon's and works globally. He also founded Spurgeon's College, which was named after him posthumously. And I could go over all these things, but it would take a long, long time. And I don't think that you want to spend that long with me here in this video. But I do want to talk to you about this 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith to which Mr. Spurgeon was an adherent. This is just a part, this is paragraph three of the part of this Baptist Confession of Faith, which talks about the Trinity. It's called, this section is called, uh, let me just scroll up real quick. It's called Of God and the Holy Trinity. And this is one of the articles of the Baptist Confession of Faith from 1689. And I'm going to read to you paragraph three. It says, in this divine and infinite being, there are three substances. He's talking about God, okay, this divine and infinite being. In this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences. Pardon me, not substances. Subsistences. The Father, the Word or Son, and Holy Spirit. Of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten, nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. All infinite without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on him. That is complete and total nonsense. It's 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 nothing but pagan mythology. It has nothing to do with anything that's written in the scripture at all. Remember we talked earlier about the fact that the Bible says if any man speak let him speak as the oracles of God. Okay? There there are no subsistences in God. In fact that word isn't in the scripture. Um, and there is no the Father, the Word, or Son, and Holy Spirit. Those words are not written in the Scripture anywhere. I mean, yeah, those words are found in the Scripture in different places, but that sentence isn't found in the Scripture anywhere. We're not called to take words out of the Scripture and make sentences out of them where they don't belong. We're called to speak as the oracles of God. Okay, um, The Son of God is not the Word of God. That's very important for us to understand. The Bible does not say anywhere or suggest anywhere that the Son of God is God's Word. Okay, The Word of God is God. And this is very explicitly written in the Scripture in the first sentence of the book of the Gospel according to John. Okay, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Right? There's nothing in that sentence about the Son of God. The Bible doesn't say that the Word was the Son of God. The Bible says very clearly that the Word was God. God, capital G-O-D. Whenever you see the word God with a capital G in the Bible, any any time you see the word God in the Bible with a capital G, it's only talking about one person. It's talking about the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only true God. And Jesus Christ testified of this fact. In John 17, 3, when he was praying to his Father, to his God and my God, he said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. Okay? Life eternal is to know the only true God. This is what Jesus said. He is the true and faithful witness. And he said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. Okay? Jesus told us two very important things there. Number one, to have eternal life means to know God. And he also told us that the only true God was the God that he was praying to. This is the truth of the scripture. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not a deity. He is not a divine person. He is a man. Okay, now... There are those of you who are going to get mad at me and you're going to say, you're saying Jesus Christ is just a man. Hold on a second. I have never said that Jesus Christ is just a man. Okay, so if you think that I've said that, it's because you imagined something that I never said. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is certainly not just a man. He is the Son of the living God. He is the Son of the living God. But he's not a God called the Son. And therein lies the difference between the doctrine of Christ and Roman paganism. Okay? The doctrine of Christ from the Bible, the Bible tells us that God has a son, his only begotten son, Jesus of Nazareth. He is the, the only begotten son of God, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. It wasn't God who gave himself on a cross. God did not die on a cross. God was not born of a virgin. God wasn't born of anybody. And God never died and cannot ever die. It was the Son of God who was born of a virgin and who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. The Son of God is a man. He was crucified. He was put to death on the cross for sinners. Okay, That wasn't God who died. It wasn't a God who died. It was the Son of God who died. It wasn't the Word of God who died. The Word of God was not put to death. The Word of God cannot be put to death. The Word of God is everlasting. Jesus spoke of that Word and he said, Until heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass away. My words shall never pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. So the Word of God was not nailed to a tree. The Word of God was not killed. The Son of God isn't the Word of God. The Word of God is in the Son of God, but the Son of God isn't the Word. The Son of God was not eternally begotten. Okay, The, the, the phrase eternally begotten is nonsense. It's what we call in English an oxymoron. It's an impossibility. There's no such thing as eternally begotten. There can't be any such thing as eternally begotten. And this is part of the reason why when the people that, you know, when, when Rome's preachers from Satan come to you and teach you about the Trinity, they teach you that it's a divine mystery and that you'll never be able to understand it and that no man can, can understand God. No man can know God. Well, wait a second. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. So if Jesus said that life eternal is to know the only true God, and these theologians come to you and they tell you that you can't know the only true God, then which one is telling you the truth? You see, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the only true God. And his son Jesus Christ was begotten in the womb of a virgin about 2,000 years ago. He was not eternally begotten. 
There is no such thing, and there can be no such thing. That's ridiculous. Because begotten means that a seed entered into the womb of a woman and a baby was conceived in the womb of a woman. That's what begotten means. And eternally means, it refers to the notion that someone has no beginning and no end. So if someone has no beginning and no end, then he cannot have been begotten. That's not possible. It's not only not possible, it's completely ridiculous. So it's a lie. It's paganism. And this is what Charles Spurgeon believed and taught. So we know from this that Charles Spurgeon was not in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that he was not a Christian. We also know that he did not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ because if, you, if, if someone believes the stuff that I just read to you from paragraph 3 of, of the, the Baptist Confession of Faith from 1689 of, of God and the Holy Trinity, anyone who believes that which is written in this paragraph that I just read to you cannot obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe that God is a trinity of divine persons and that the Son of God is actually God the Son and he was eternally begotten and that these are three deities that are distinct from one another but actually all three equally God, then you can't obey the gospel of Christ because you can't believe on the name of the only begotten Son of God. You don't know what the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost is if you believe in a trinity of gods. And that's part of the deception my brothers and sisters, my friends and neighbors. That's part of the deception that, that Charles Spurgeon believed and that people like him are teaching. Now, again, I'm not slandering the man. I'm just stating a fact. And like I said, when I was first coming up in the Lord, I used to listen to guys like Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, um, you know, another, uh, and the other spectrum, like the Word of Faith movement, like T.D. Jakes and Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin and, and all those guys. I know that they're circus clowns basically now. I know that I don't mean that as a slander, but I mean that they're sideshow, uh, um, how should I say this, sideshow entertainers. Those guys don't even really think that they're Christians. Okay, Charles Spurgeon, I believe, he really believed he was a Christian. But Kenneth Copeland, uh, I don't believe for a second that he really thinks that he's a Christian. Um, I believe that he's a friend of the papacy, and I believe that behind the scenes when he's drinking champagne and doing drugs or whatever with his wife and, and the Pope or whatever and all their little friends, I believe that they laugh at how stupid people are. Uh, because they, they believe the Bible. I, Kenneth Copeland doesn't believe the Bible. He doesn't think that he's a Christian. I, I, I just don't believe that for a second. Um, but anyway, that's, that's beside the point. But Charles Spurgeon was, in, in my estimation, from, from what I can see from here in the future, not ever having met the man, I believe that he was probably a very sincere individual. Um, but he was very sincerely wrong, and he was very sincerely confused. And, and there's probably a lot of sermons that he's written that are still being preached today that might be helpful to to Christians as far as like um, precepts about loving your neighbor and overcoming by the word of God and faith and things like that. Um, and, and those things might tend to draw people in. But the more you get drawn in by the themes of particular sermons that he might have preached that seem helpful in the beginning, the more you're going to get drawn into the darkness of the satanic doctrines that Charles Spurgeon believed and preached, which were according to this Confession of Faith of 1689, like I just mentioned to you. And because the man believed in a trinity of gods, then he also believed in a false gospel which saves no one. And basically he was a Calvinist. Um, he didn't call himself a Calvinist, but the religion, the religious organization that he belonged to was Calvinist in nature. And Calvinism is a cancer among the denominations. Calvinism is a, is, a, is a wicked cancer that turns people completely away from the Word of God and causes people to believe that they're Christians when they've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. It causes people to despise the gospel of Jesus Christ and to despise Christians. And it also teaches people that even though they've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, that they're somehow saved, that they also can never lose their salvation. And so you have all these people that are lost in their sins that believe that they're Christians because Calvinism has taught them that they're Christians even though they've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. And so then they're all arguing with people about, you know, we can never lose our salvation. Well, they're, they're arguing about something that is moot because they have no salvation. They haven't been saved from anything. 
And there's a video on this channel about that. It's called Once Saved, Always Saved. If you believe that, you're not saved, and you don't even know how to be saved. And that's the truth, because the only people that would that would argue with people about this once saved, always saved, and try to prove that nonsense to people are people that don't know anything about how to be saved from their sins. They believe that they're saved just because of the fact that they agree with the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. They agree with that fact, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, so their pastors have told them they're saved. And they open up to the book of Ephesians and tell them, look, the Bible says, by grace you're saved through faith. And then they add the word alone twice, and they make a doctrine out of it. You're saved by grace alone through faith alone. Well, wait a second. They never stopped to consider the fact that the letter that is called Ephesians was written to Christians. It wasn't written to Calvinists. And you can go back to the book of Acts, and you can see how the disciples at Ephesus became Christians when Paul preached the gospel to them and he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus and he laid his hands on them and they spoke with other tongues and prophesied. That's what happened when Paul met the disciples at Ephesus. And those are the Ephesians. Those are the ones that Paul wrote the letter to that's called Ephesians. And so Paul said that they were saved by grace through faith. And yes, they were. And yes, I am. Praise the Lord. That doesn't mean that we don't have to obey the gospel of Christ to be saved. But that's what these people believe. And that was part of the belief of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He believed Calvinist doctrine. He believed that a man is saved uh, solely by the grace of God without doing anything. Um, from him came the doctrines that are so prevalent in Calvinist churches today that, that you know people say you can't do anything to be saved. If you try to do anything to be saved, then you're adding to the finished work of Christ on the cross. That's what people say in these, in these antichrist churches. So they totally, completely ignore the doctrine that the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ preached, and they pretend that that just doesn't exist. They completely ignore the book of the Acts of the Apostles, where we have a historical account of the gospel being preached time after time after time, and people obeying the gospel and becoming Christians. And they just go straight to the epistles, imagining that they're Christians when they've never obeyed the gospel, and then they, they apply the, the words of the epistles to the churches, to themselves, as if they were Christians when they're not. And that's where they get most of their confusion from. And it's because of Calvinism. And then they think that they know the Bible, but they, they haven't searched the scriptures. They've just, they, they only read the portions of their Bible that their Calvinist teachers quote to them, along with the lies that their Calvinist teachers are telling them. You see? So that's why people believe in that nonsense. And, and Charles Haddon Spurgeon, like I said, he, he might have been a very nice man, and there might be very, very many messages from him that start off seeming as though they are very helpful in, in applying the Word of God in practical areas in our lives. But the, the dangerous thing is that if you get caught up in that, then you start listening to Charles Spurgeon more and more, and you start getting the idea that you're saved without obeying the gospel, and that God is the trinity of persons, and that baptism is just a, an outward showing of an inward change, that it is an ordinance, like the Lord's Supper. Uh, baptism is not an ordinance. <laughs> it's something that a sinner does in order to be saved from his sins. Jesus Christ said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He did not say, He that believeth shall be saved and baptized. Okay, or he, he did not say, He that believeth and is saved shall be baptized. He didn't say that. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism is not an ordinance in the church. Baptism is how people get saved from their sins and become part of the church. That's what baptism is. You see, but people that believe in a trinity of gods can't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ because when Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, this is a stumbling block to those people that believe that God is a trinity of divine persons. Because people that believe that God is a trinity of divine persons also believe that Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are names of three persons. And if you really think about it, that's kind of silly. In fact, it's really silly. It's ridiculous. Because Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are not names, and there are no three persons. And when Jesus Christ spoke those words, he didn't make any mention of any three persons. The, the only thing that he was making mention of is a name that his disciples were to use to baptize people. A name. One name. That's what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. There's no, th there's no mention of any three persons. There's no mention of any persons at all. 
the thing that's being mentioned in that verse of the scripture is a name. Because Jesus was giving his disciples instructions on what to do and what name to baptize people in. He said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. When he said this, who was he talking about by the word me? Was he talking about us? A trinity of persons? Us? All power is given unto us in heaven and in earth? No, he didn't say that. He said, all power is given unto me. Who was he referring to by the word me? Himself. The Son of God. The Son of God. And the Father that sent him was in him. God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. What about the Holy Ghost, Brother Clinton? The Holy Ghost is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in the first chapter of Matthew that when Mary was found pregnant, that she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the father of the child that was in Mary's womb. When Jesus said, My Father, that's who he was talking about. He was talking about the Holy Ghost. God is holy, and God is a spirit. A spirit is a ghost. Holy Spirit and Holy Ghost are synonymous terms that are, word, that are used interchangeably throughout the Scripture. So the only Holy Spirit that there is, the only Holy Spirit that there is, is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Holy Spirit. He was in his Son, Jesus Christ. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Godhead is not a trinity of persons. The Godhead is God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in him, the Son of God, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's just that simple. God was in Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Charles Spurgeon didn't know this. He didn't know this because he didn't search the scriptures. He studied theology. And as far as I know, he died in the same beliefs that, we just, that I just shared with you, uh, which is historically recorded about him. Now, I could be wrong about that. Maybe sometime before his death, maybe he searched the scriptures and came to the knowledge of the truth and was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, I don't know that to be so, and I, in fact, I, I rather doubt it. But I won't say that it's not possible because I wasn't there. However, I do know that if he abode in the doctrines that I have just discussed with you in this video, then he died lost. And if you are reading his material or listening to his sermons or following after his teachings, even though he was a great orator and he was a very eloquent speaker, he was not teaching the truth and he was leading people astray into the ditch. He was a minister of Satan. And therefore he appears, appeared and appears as a minister of righteousness. Because he makes references to the word of God here and there, but then he departs from the word of God and preaches the doctrines of Rome. And the Trinity is a doctrine of Rome. Okay, The teaching that you can be saved from your sins without obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ is a doctrine of Rome. The teaching that baptism is an ordinance in the church is a doctrine of Rome. The teaching that if you, if you do anything to save yourself, then you're adding to the finished work of Christ on the cross is a doctrine of Rome. And Rome is a habitation of devils and of every foul spirit and every unclean and hateful bird. That's where those doctrines come from. So, in closing, I want to let you know again that I'm not here to speak evil of a dead man. Okay, he may have been a very nice man, and I'm not here to speak evil about him as a person. But I'm telling you in the name of Jesus Christ, as a minister of Jesus Christ, that Charles Haddon Spurgeon was not a Christian. He was not in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. He did not believe the doctrine of Christ. He was a purveyor of the doctrines of Rome. He was a theologian raised up in the doctrines of the Baptist Church among the particular Baptists, which were Calvinist in nature, and he believed in a false trinity of gods which doesn't exist, a false Jesus which doesn't exist, because the, the, the deity called God the Son doesn't exist. 
Okay, He believed in a false gospel that can save no one. He denied the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though it's written in the scripture over and over and over. It's very plain. You have to try not to find it in order to avoid seeing the doctrine of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ in the scripture. So if you believe in a Jesus that is called God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, my friend, you are lost. And that Jesus that you're believing in doesn't even exist, and it cannot save you from the wrath of God. There is no God called the Son. There is no God called the Son. The only true God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Son of God testified of that fact. And it's written in the Bible for us. And not just in John 17, 3, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. There is one God. One God. That's all. There is one God. And one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. One God and one man does not equal three persons. So there is no Trinity. There is no triune God. There are no Calvinists in the Church of Jesus Christ. Calvinism is a cancer. It's lies from the devil. It's sent to pervert and twist the word of God and to cause people to believe false doctrines that are not in the Bible and a false gospel that can save no one. It's actually so silly that it would be hilarious if it wasn't so tragic that it, it, the, the Calvinist doctrine actually teaches people that they're Christians without obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. It teaches people to, to deny the gospel of Jesus Christ, to refuse to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, and yet to proclaim themselves to be Christians. And not only to proclaim that they are saved when they have refused to obey the gospel of Christ, but also to declare that they can never become unsaved. And that's pretty ridiculous, if you ask me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And even if you don't ask me, I'll tell you, that's pretty ridiculous. That's just crazy. I mean, that's just that's a symptom of, of psychotic uh, psychosis. Someone is psychotic if they believe something so ridiculous, especially when they have access to a Bible and they could read it for themselves. So, praise the Lord. This is what I needed to tell you about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Again, not saying anything evil about the man, but the things that he believed and taught were lies from the devil. And so, if you are new in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're just coming out of the darkness to serve the Lord... Be aware that I have told you that the devil will send his ministers and they will come out of the woodwork and they will come out of every crack and crevice. And I'm not speaking evil against the people, but because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. That's, that's what we wrestle against. And these people in the various denominations who believe that they're Christians, they're very, they're very zealous and they're, they, they really, they're nice people most of the time. And they really think that they're Christians. They really think that they're doing good. They're, they're not saying to themselves, oh, I, I serve the devil. Who can I deceive today? They're not thinking that at all. They're thinking that they serve God. However, they are sent by the devil because they don't know God. And they're sent by the devil to come to you and to pull you away from the light as quickly as, as the devil can try to pull you away from the light. Because as soon as he sees you come into the light, the, the first thing he's going to try to do is pull you away from that light. And one of his favorite ways to do that, which is why he invented the Jesuit order under the Roman Catholic papacy, is to cause you to falsely believe that you're a Christian when you're not. Is to divert your attention away from the Bible, get you out of the scriptures and into a religious organization or a religious doctrine that will use the scriptures but to lie to you and to keep you away from the truth of God see that's going to happen as soon as you come as soon as you begin to come out of the darkness the devil is going to send his ministers to you to try to pull you away from the light and pull you and, and pull you into the darkness of whatever denomination that you know there's there's hundreds of them for you to choose from the devil doesn't care which denomination you choose it doesn't, he, he couldn't care less what denomination you choose as long as he can keep you away from the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his goal, you see. And so your responsibility as a Christian is to shun all those things and to stay in the word of God and obey Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If Charles Spurgeon had done that, he wouldn't have died lost. But if you will do that, then you can be saved and you can inherit eternal life. Praise the Lord. This is Brother Clinton. I'm out for now. I hope this was a blessing to you. He that hath an ear to hear, 
let him hear. Amen.